I wanted to remind us today of what the Media Project is and who we are and what we do. Um, and um, this is the front of our website, the mediaproject.org. And what we do is we equip journalists to cover religion and we provide ways for them to do that. And this quote by a columnist at the Washington Post named Michael Gerson hit the nail on the head of why we do this. What's the problem that we're trying to address in society? He said, a journalism that ignores or dismisses the role of religion in our common life misses the great stories of our time. And so we don't wanna miss the great stories of our time. Uh, we wanna help news organizations and the world really see those stories. Another, just a different perspective since Michael Gerson was a speechwriter to George Bush um, before he was a columnist. Um, Dean Baquette is the top editor of the New York Times. And after Trump was elected in 2016, he was on a radio interview. And he said the same thing Michael Gerson said, but in a different way. He said, I think the New York based and Washington based media powerhouses don't quite get religion. Uh, they, at that time, they only had one religion writer. He says, we don't get religion. We don't get the role of religion in people's lives and I think we can do much better. So that's what we exist to help with. The Media Project, as you know, does two main things. One, we're a professional network of about 2000 members, I believe now, <clears throat> um, and our mediaproject.org. We have our own Twitter channel, which I hope you're following at mediaproject.org. And as you know, we provide education, training, and professional development on religion reporting, normally that happens in person around the world each year at Pointer program in Florida, our EJI program in Prague, our Laji program in Chile, our Opji program in Indonesia, um, AJI and AFP in Africa, and even in New York, our program for undergrad students. So um, that's what we do from an education training standpoint. And, and then the second thing we do is Religion Unplugged which is two years old. It's the new non nonprofit online magazine for, of the Media Project. And you can sign up for email headlines if you don't already, uh, right from that site. A pop-up window comes up if you go to that site. And you can also follow that site on Twitter at Religion Mag. And what we do there is we try to limit how many stories we publish. So 10 to 20 per week, one original story per day, which is we call the slow journalism movement. We're not trying to flood the internet with copy, but trying to add really smart journalism, uh, news features, expert analysis and commentary. And in uh, just two years, we've really been growing. In previous years, the old Media Project sites never had more than about 3000 unique visitors per month to the journalism. Now we had in August, we had 100,000 uh, page views of the site. And we're up to around you know, 60,000 unique visitors per month on average for this year. And we're growing, which is wonderful. So your journalism on our site is having more impact and more audience. We also have podcast, YouTube channel, Instagram, Twitter. So we're surfacing your journalism to, on many different formats. And as, so as you know, here's a picture. I recognize some people on the call, I think from this photo, from the call yesterday and today, uh, this was a couple of years ago, a picture from our pointer class in Florida. And because of the global pandemic, as you know, we can't meet in person. So I'm so glad we're able to do this program online for more people than we normally can bring to Florida. So that's wonderful. And thanks to Melissa Harrison for her great work on that. The other thing we're doing during a, the pandemic year is we've hosted a series of events once, once a month on this topic of, of racial understanding, I would say. And we are looking back in history at what hope Christianity brought in Africa and what hope that, that um, brings to race relations in America in 2020. So we had a, a lecture August uh, 6 with Vince Bantu that many of you joined on Facebook Live. We had one last month with Dr. David Daniels who looked at uh, Africa Christians in Europe and Africa before 1700. That was also fantastic. And those are on our YouTube channel. So you can watch those there if you miss them on Facebook. And we have one coming up on Thursday on Facebook Live uh, at noon Eastern time. And this is Lisa Fields, 
and who's, she's going to talk about reclaiming Christianity, connecting to its African roots. So I encourage you to join us at our Religion Unplugged Facebook page for that lecture. And I'm sure maybe Melissa can give us more announcements of that today and tomorrow. So let's talk briefly about Religion Unplugged, which is we're going to spend the next half hour together working together and doing some group work around this. So uh, Religion Unplugged, it's an online magazine and podcast. Um, we publish stories about religion from around the world. We have a mix of contributors of veteran journalists and new journalists. Um, as I told you, you can sign up for headlines and follow us on Twitter. And in the first two years of our site's life, we've also, because of the quality of journalism that's happening there, we've been winning some awards. So we won from Editor and Publisher Award last year for Best News, Culture, and Entertainment site. Um, we've won three awards from Religion News Association this year, including some of the toughest categories. Um, we placed above reporters from the New York Times in some of these categories and other, you know, major, major publications uh, for investigative stories, for best story of the year, um, uh, and best online reporting, and a student award for best uh, student journalist about religion in the whole world. So. Uh, really good things are happening and we want to make sure that the media project members around the world realize what's happening and, and are part of it and um, helping us do this important journalism work on our site. So let's talk about, that was a screenshot of uh, a front page and I think when I grabbed that screenshot back, I mean it was a, a year ago, it shows you the, the breadth the different countries and different religions that we're covering on this site, not comprehensively, but again, as a magazine. So let's talk about, before you guys break into groups and come up with story ideas and chat about stories happening in your places, like our friend from Ethiopia was telling us about his country, um, let's talk about what kinds of stories work. So I'm gonna give you some categories and then we're gonna hear from Megan Clark, my colleague at Religion Unplugged to talk a little more of what qualities of stories uh, work for us. So we always like stories that are off the news or newsy stories. Um, and we appreciate those coming in from all parts of the world. One example this year of a story that did well on our site, our intern Liza Vandenboom for this last year, she's the one who won the prize, one of the prizes from Religion News Association. She uh, started seeing on Twitter and on Reddit and these kinds of platforms that this case in Minnesota about a, a man named George Floyd who died while being arrested by police, she saw that there was, it was gaining momentum and that people were very upset about it. And she started seeing something that he had been a uh, Christian believer in Houston. So she found the pastor in Houston and did an interview with the pastor and some of George Floyd's friends who were doing ministry in uh, a housing project in Houston and did a wonderful interview about that and, and did some more reporting and got a sense of the spiritual life of George Floyd. And we did, we published our story there on May 28th. I think Christianity Today was the only other outlet that we saw reporting on that aspect of George Floyd's life that same day. So our story was republished in Newsweek um, and also in, um, oh, Religion News Service. And you know, your publications can republish any of our stories so long as they say, hey, this was originally published at Religion Unplugged and provide a link back. So that's one of the services that we offer. So uh, this was a, just a really original piece right off the news connected to the news by our intern. Another, so another category of stories are feature stories, which may be not as newsy. It's nice if they connect to news, but they are written more uh, with a different style of writing. And so I grabbed one example from Kenya. Uh, Thomas Sanjo does some really nice stories for us from Kenya. And he did some reporting into how uh, Muslims in Kenya are grappling with COVID-19 restrictions around burials. So he talked to different uh, Muslim leaders and participants and explained that part of religious life in Kenya. We also have stories about culture. Uh, we have a, a section about books, TV, film, art and music, travel. And I grabbed one story from Lucy, who I see is on the call today. She wrote about a pilgrimage, um, this Indian village's devotion to St. Anthony. Unique, beautiful photos, and takes us to another place during a pandemic where we, uh, where we can take a virtual pilgrimage and understand people's pilgrimages. 
our commentary analysis section. Uh, one recent piece there was by a correspondent who writes for us from Jerusalem, and he wrote about how ritual baths in the Jewish faith are a battleground uh, as Israel's trying to stop uh, COVID-19 from spreading there and the ritual purity bath. So he just explained that. It's a, some reporting, but it was also some opinion uh, that he included. So um, that was that. Our last category I'm mentioning here is we're interested in multimedia stories, photo stories, video stories, podcast episodes, if that's you, the kind of journalism that you like to do. This is an example from a fellow uh, we had last year, a correspondent from India named Avinash Giri, who went with some colleagues to Kashmir when India had sort of taken control of Kashmir um, and there was some protests and violence. And it turned out our reporters were the only ones I'm told who got into, excuse me, into the protest zone this particular day and documented what was happening and men and women were both out in the streets. Some got hit by tear gas. <clears throat> we saw the passion. We saw people who'd been injured in previous days protests coming out, even children coming out, which is rare. And we saw people who got hit by uh, bird shot, shotgun pellets. And these photos were wonderful and original to us and showed the anguish and the pain um, that was developing in the region. And frankly, because we were the only ones there that day, sometimes the work you're doing for our site is acting as a witness, a witness to history, witness to people's lives, a witness to uh, belief, um, a witness to many things. And that's, we think that's important. We think it's important for you all to have an outlet where you can publish uh, material that's important to you and to people in the places you're from. Okay, so with that, I'm going to uh, introduce Megan Clark. Some of you know her, maybe some of you don't. When you pitch stories, you can pitch those by email to myself and Megan. We'll go over that shortly. Um, and, uh, but Megan is full-time an editor on our site. She, I'm executive editor, she's managing editor. And so she's the one most often working with the copy. And so uh, bef I'm, you can see the instructions here that we'll go over in just a moment, but I also want to have Megan come on and talk a little bit um, before we break you into groups for 10 minutes to discuss what story you would pitch to Religion Unplugged right now. And then we'll have you guys select one person or story from your group who will pitch to our broader group in 60 seconds or less. And we will set a timer and see how the journalists can keep to the, the 60 second limit. And, um, but let's hear from Megan about uh, what kinds of stories are interesting for us, okay? And what qualities those have. Hi, everyone. Good morning for some people. Um, I guess it's evening for most people, perhaps. Um, but let me share my screen. I just dropped a link into the chat that you can open. Um, and then I'll also share my screen. And we wanted to put something together that everyone could refer to if you're interested in pitching us stories, that just kind of goes over what categories of stories uh, we tend to publish and what categories of stories we're looking for. So some of those examples, you know, Paul mentioned, we want original stories, something creative about religion and religious people. We like religion in public life. So some examples are religious freedom. That's a big issue in probably all of our countries. So whenever you see a clash between um, some uh, government intervention and a religious group, so right now that's a lot of COVID-19 restrictions, um, but it could be many things. So I put examples, just a few examples um, of stories that we've published that go over that. Um, one recent one we had from a Media Project fellow last year, um, he's from Chile and he wrote, um, an opinion piece that was an explainer about why some two Catholic churches in Chile recently were set uh, on fire. And so sometimes I think uh, some of you might think, well, why should I write that? Everyone knows that. Well, a lot of people that are not from your country may not understand that at all. So that's one thing that I think should be highlighted is that, um, you know, your local news probably all 
uh, is, is a lot different. People know what's going on, but our audience is pretty global and we like to explain to our audience why this matters and go a little deeper on religion. So that's what he did. And it was um, really interesting to people to connect that arson to what's going on um, as far as their protests in Chile on economic inequality and their constitution. Um, another category is religion, power, economics, and people. That can be um, people in politics or people in powerful positions like churches and nonprofits. A um, couple examples we have from Uganda from another fellow from the Media Project that we had last year. Um, I don't know if anyone knows him here, but his name is John uh, Simakula. He wrote about how clergy in Uganda are thinking of running or running in politics this year and why that's controversial. And then he also wrote another story about an American missionary in Uganda who um, got into legal trouble and was accused of some child deaths and what happened in her case. Um, so holding people accountable in religion and um, in religious institutions and maybe religious people in politics are two examples. Um, and then we also have uh, politics and religion uh, category where we're looking at how do religious people vote what are the faith lives of candidates, um, movements and trends, and how faith is lived out in um, civic life. Uh, one example is uh, we've done a couple of different data stories, but um, someone did a data analysis for us on the American Muslim vote. So that's one example of how do different religious categories affect voting in your area. Um, then we also have a section we're calling social justice and religion um, or faith and good works. Um, here is a good section where we, we love profiles of people doing good work, um, positive stories of how religion can help a community and maybe things that are very overlooked because a lot of people in those positions um, don't really get talked about because they never make the news. Um, but we like to bring out like, how are people doing good work in unusual or interesting ways. Um, there's one profile we did of an Egyptian Muslim doctor who, a uh, surgeon actually, who voluntarily would go to places like Syria and help um, both sides of the conflict and help save their lives. So stories like that. Um, and then we also have the culture section, like Paul mentioned, so that could be book reviews, um, Q and A's with authors, film and TV news and reviews, music reviews, travel and food stories, art reviews, um, any interviews or profiles of uh, musicians or you know, celebrities that have a religious faith. Um, so one example I put in here quickly was a link um, to a story where we had a Lebanese woman who went to a French Christian commune and she wrote about her experience. So that was a travel story. She wrote about her experience being in a multi-faith community and how um, both the Christians who hosted her and her as a Muslim woman uh, shared their experiences and understood the other person's religion more. So those are just several ideas. I know that was a lot, but you can keep this document and refer back to it. Um, and then we have our emails here and Twitter and Facebook. Um, I originally made this for students, so that's why I put a link on tips for pitching a story. You guys probably already know that, but um, if you wanna share this to younger reporters too, we just wanna keep that on there so everyone can get an idea of what kind of stories we're looking for. And let me know if you have any questions. <laughs> Great, thank you, Megan. Melissa, how are we gonna manage these breakouts? Hey, the breakout rooms are set. You've all been assigned. So I'm going to divide you up. Um, what you'll wanna do is everybody kind of choose somebody who's gonna be your spokesperson when you come back for our lightning round story share, our pitch session that's gonna come. You're gonna have 60 seconds, like Paul said, to share your story idea. So what you wanna do is go into these breakout rooms, share your story ideas, one story from your home country, um, and then you guys select one that you think is the one you'd like to pitch in the larger group session. And you come back together and do that. So right now I'm going to break you into breakout rooms and you can, I think you have to elect say accept and then you'll move into breakouts. You guys share, I'll give you a two minute warning 
Um, and then we'll all come back together for our story pitch session. All right, here we go. Tom, can you hear us? And Jacob, you guys should be invited to a breakout. Are you seeing where to go? So, Melissa, will you call everybody back then at 10, yeah. 1040? 1040, okay. I'll give them a two minute warning at 38. Okay. Great. I'm gonna go get another coffee. <laughs> okay, <laughs> gotta stay fueled. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Helen, hola. How are you? Como estas? Muy bien, gracias Hola, a Dios. Hola, Jalín, ¿cómo estás? Bien, disculpa que estoy entrando ahorita, es que tenía tres reuniones simultáneas a la misma oh, hora. Yo comprendo. Entre WhatsApp y es horrible. Sí, yo, yo bueno. comprendo completamente. Lo voy a hacer, es, estamos en breakout rooms ahora, para, teniendo discusiones, entonces voy a ponerte en la una de las chicas latinas. ¿Está bien? Está bien. Por pocos Buenísimo. minutos. Ok. Gracias. Okay, momentito. Okay, creo que hay tiene que aceptarlo.
Oscar, can you Hi, hear me? Melissa. Hi, Oscar. ¿Cómo estás? I, bien. Thank you very much. I need to uh, return to room one, please. Ok, momentito. Voy a ponerte. Thank you. Ok. Tom, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Melissa. Hi, Tom. How are you? Fine. Nice to see you. Good to hear you. Oh, my goodness. Yes. Okay. They are in breakout rooms having a little bit of a discussion. I'm going to put you in the room with um, Dominic and Sanjeev, okay? Um, yes. Just, ta oh, so good to see you. <laughs> yeah. uh, it's really good to see you. Have yes. you been? I've been very fine. Good. All of that, all of that I'm running two meetings parallel, <laughs> one in the office and this one. So, oh, so no. I have to sleep up checking. Yes. <laughs> You're like, I know. It's hard. I want to be, it's so many things happening at one time. Um, yes. I'm going to put you over in the room with Dominic and um, Sanjeev just because I know that they would love to see you and talk to you. Hold on, let me see. Um, really? Yeah, I think. Oh, hold on. Where did I put Sanjeev? Sorry. Um, where's Dominic? <laughs> Sorry. Just one second. Okay, I'm going to try to, and, and um, Jennifer is in that room too. So I know she'll be excited to see you. Hold on just one second, okay? Okay. Just one second. Let's see if it'll let me. It might not for some reason. You know, for whatever reason. Uh, it's not showing me as being able to assign you, but that's okay. Yeah, I don't know why it's doing that. You're not showing us somebody I can assign. So I get to talk to you. Perfect. <laughs> so how is your family? How's everything been? Everything is fine. Just uh, working from home since March. Yeah. And, uh, and we've been told most likely we go back in February, not anytime soon. I know. It's so crazy. Yeah. The whole world. Yeah. The whole world. I wish we were at the... I remember so well having conversation with you at the Hampton Inn and before breakfast and yeah. the pointer, so many special memories there. Yeah. I know. It makes me appreciate it even more now because we can't take it for granted. We, you know. Yeah, we can't take a group photo. I know. I know. I've got to remember to take one today, though, at least of, of the image on. <laughs> Did you move to New York or still in uh, Texas? I'm still in Texas. Unfortunately, New York is right now really difficult because of uh, COVID. My husband's business um, is still getting going. So we weren't able to get to New York full time because it's so expensive. But we are, yeah. Um, yeah, we're in Texas. I miss New York though. I love it. Although I know it's a hard place to be right now, you know, with COVID. It's not easy for friends in New York mm -hmm. right now. Are there any, I know you do such a good job of sharing stories. Um, are there any stories right now from, from your country that you, I know you are constantly pitching ideas to us though, so that's. So yes, the, the, the one Megan posted on Sunday. Okay. This one was from Tanzania. Uh -huh. and, uh, and she had Paul approved one. Uh, Kenyans and Africans generally are debating the, the statement from Pope Francis that uh, the people in same-sex relationship yeah. needs protection. So it's it's interesting because Africans are now saying if they are doing that, then they, we should be allowed to have polygamies in the church. And uh, wow. Okay, I want you to pitch that story idea. Okay. To I have people. already. It's already been. It's already been approved. Oh, it has. Okay. Yes. Wow. I know we so appreciate your contributions to the site. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Um, for some reason, AJ Philip, let me see real quickly. Um, let's see. Paul Gladder, are you back? No, Paul is back yet. Hey, there's Tom. Hey, you're back. Okay, Tom's here. Tom is in the house. Okay, I think they have like one more minute, Paul, and then I'll let him in. Okay, you missed, we, 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 uh, we showcased your story, Tom. Yes, I, I, I was there. I, oh, I saw good. it. <laughs> good. The one on Muslims and COVID burials. Yes. Yes, I saw it. W did you get to be part of a group also? No, for some reason, his um, mm. it's not allowing me. It's showing him as a, a, a guest. And for some reason, I can't assign him to the breakout room. It's very strange. I don't oh. know why. But. Um, so everybody's going to be coming back here shortly, yeah. right? I'm okay. going to let him in now. Okay. I'll let them in now. I got to get a pen and paper to take notes on the good ideas oh, you're going to hear. Yeah. <laughs> well, Paul, I was just, uh, Paul, I was just explaining to Melissa that I'm in and out because I have another meeting from the office. So I'm uh, juggling. Ju yes. I'm juggling. Yes. Yeah. I'm multitasking and men are not good at that, I'm told. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Melissa's a Zoom ninja, I think. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like trying to put them in the groups with people from their fellowship year, if possible, just to reconnect. Oh, good. They're taking their time. They have, they're taking, you know, as that clock is ticking for them, they have like 30 seconds more. They're all taking it. All right, guys. <clears throat> Can you hear us, uh, Melissa? Yes, this is great. Okay. I think we have a couple, let's see, a couple more groups still joining. Okay, Paul, I think everybody's back in. So would you like me to call on the groups and then you yeah. can just one person from each? Yep. Okay, so we had in our first group, room one, uh, that was our Latina group. So Giselle. Gracias. Hi. <laughs> we were uh, Helen, Oscar, uh, uh, Caroline, and uh, Christina. Okay. Uh, we did this. Christian did a process values have been reflected at the plebiscito and we want change constitution from our point of view with values. We think this is the thing that we uh, talk about uh, re uh, with a relation uh, in Chilean position with church now. Christians did the process with values had been reflected at the plebiscito and we want to change constitutions. That's all we did. Okay, so it sounds like that you see that as a, a story to continue following. So maybe some of you can watch that issue and propose either a profile of somebody related to it or an analysis piece. So we'll look for that. Thank you, Giselle. Okay, we understood we need to do uh, a child in six, uh, 60 seconds? Yes. yes. Okay, <laughs> that's why. <laughs> yes, uh, I think maybe Caroline uh, wants to tell something or maybe Oscar. Oscar had a, a difficult with his uh, microphone, that's yeah. why. 
he 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 can uh, communicate with us. But uh, he gave this idea. Uh, we were working about the Chilean churches that had been attacked in this uh, uh, last last uh, Sunday. He told us about it, and uh, now the Catholic Church has not a, a clear position with Chilean people. Uh, Chileans had a thought that the church doesn't have anything to do in this society. And uh, Graciela told that uh, the last um, Sunday they went to vote for the constitution, but now they can go to the um, cemeteries uh, to visit their parents and and they are doubt about it. They think they they don't have Eric now and there is not um, a good position from the government in order to respect uh, uh, Catholics or Christian people in this way. Maybe Graciela, do you want to tell something about it? Um, yeah, I can sp speak um, briefly about the Catholic Church. Um, Oscar knows more about the, the Evangelical churches. Um, so there was um, a referendum on Sunday where the government encouraged everyone to go and vote. And uh, despite many um, parts of the country be being uh, under lockdown, mandatory lockdown on the weekends, uh, saying it was safe to go and the, 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 there was no problem. And this weekend, it's uh, the day of the death um, and people usually visit cemeteries, they, they visit their um, relatives and they, the, the government ordered to have cemeteries closed because it was a risk of contagion. And cemeteries are open or parks. I mean, it's, it's even safer than going to cemetery than going to boat. Uh, so there is, uh, how would you say, an incongruency on, on public policy about what should be open, what should be closed, I mean, uh, what is safe, what it, what it isn't. And, and I don't see the church saying anything about this. Interesting. I, that's interesting. Megan, any quick comment? Um, I like that idea from Graciela. Um, yeah, I think that sounds great. Um, would you want to write that as a news story or an opinion? Um, I can write it, um, I suppose it's a news story, yeah. Uh, let me see what would be, um, if I can get some sources to speak to me. Yeah. <laughs> otherwise, uh, otherwise I can write it as an opinion. Great. Okay, yeah, that sounds great. So Melissa, we gotta speed up a little bit. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I'll set the timer this time. Okay, Dominic, Kurtho, Jennifer, Lucy, and Sanjeev. Okay, Melissa, for our uh, group room two, we uh, have uh, agreed. Actually, there were two stories that we uh, have discussed, and then uh, the, the group decided that I should go first. If there's enough time, Dominic will go after me. So um, we, we are going to pitch a story about uh, recent situation intolerance in Indonesia right now, something that just recently happened. Uh, it might seem trivia, but actually uh, it has something very deep. Uh, the, the situation is um, a teacher at a public school here in 58 uh, public school in East Jakarta. Uh, uh, actually, people... People, uh, people got the screenshot from uh, what she said on a WhatsApp group. So she, she told uh, her students, because the, right now they are in, in, in the election time to vote for a uh, you know, president of student body. So she suggested the students in the WhatsApp group to vote for candidate number three, since the candidate number three is uh, the candidate with, you know, uh, with the Muslim background, which is the, the majority here in Indonesia. So um, the WhatsApp, the, the, what she said on WhatsApp group is now going viral. I mean, like on TikTok, on, on uh, Instagram, on Twitter, uh, people discuss about it. And then funny is that uh, not so many 
journalists uh, report on that situation right now? I mean, like, uh, we agree that uh, this is something vital, like teachers should be the promoter of uh, tolerance, uh, that uh, they should be the one who promote and then to teach their students to promote, you know, living side by side with different religions and, you know, any other people from a different Different backgrounds, but here, uh, so funny that in Indonesia, you know, like sometimes they are the ones who are not promoting that. So that's all what we we are trying to pitch uh, with the story. I like the specificity of that. Really interesting. Thank you, Herto. You're welcome. Very nice. Okay, so room three: Elias, Lekan, Lydia, and Martina. Okay, so I'm speaking on behalf of the group. Um, we are pitching the story from Nigeria. Nigeria has been in the news in recent times, and it's a case of police brutality. And uh, we have had protests in Nigeria, but nothing like this before, and it's a huge revolt. But the interesting thing is that there are Christian dimension to it. So you have church leaders coming out, speaking boldly in support of the young people, advocating that the government must once and for all address this problem. While, the, while everybody was doing the normal protest, Christian youths were engaged in prayer matches, vigils during the protest. You know, and so as we speak, there have been a lot of revolts. Where we are now is the stage when the government has set up panels across the country to investigate cases. So it would be nice to hear what are the Christian proposals for, for reform of police, which are first life of everybody? Because we've never seen anything like this. But like I said, more than ever before, there have been Christian leaders come out to speak, Catholic, Anglican, as issued statement here and there. This so is Lekan, this is so good to hear because we've we've heard about the SARS and the protests. And SARS, yes. But I had not heard about religious component or dynamic of the uh, young people. So we would love a story, I think, that gets into that, if, uh, reports on it and shows us more, maybe profiles one of the young people who's religious yeah. involved in that. Yeah. Thank you. OK, great. Room number four, Elastis, Megan, Teti, and Waretta. Because uh, Elastis had a good idea. Sorry, we didn't nominate a speaker yet. <laughs> But Elastis, I think, should share. Elastis, can you unmute? Oh, you have to unmute, sorry. Sorry. OK, there you go. Sorry about, sorry about that. Right. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, the pitch was on a story that we were brainstorming just last week on uh, the implementation of sexuality, comprehensive sexuality education uh, in Zambia. And um, so the program initially started uh, about five or four or five years ago, but uh, the implementation actually, the rollout uh, started this year and there's been sort of a back and forth between Christian organizations and civil society that have been behind the push. So. Uh, the most, I think the most recent major event was a parliamentary motion to stop that uh, influenced with the backing of the church organizations. And, and, and so uh, we were we've got a couple of pieces together, but they are from sort of radio pieces, but we're trying to uh, uh, put up a, a long form feature article, sort of trace the steps on how everything has sort of gone on since the project started and where we are today. And this is from Zambia. Yes. That was pitch perfect, right on time. You stopped talking, the timer went off. Good job, Elastis. Thank you. <laughs> Nicely <laughs> done. <laughs> so feedback on the story, Paul, do you have any? It sounds interesting. It's, and Megan sounds like she knows more about it. I'm curious what the, what was in the curriculum that made people so upset or, uh, but then I'm sure we can f hear more on that over email, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect. Room five, Charles, Josephine, and Silvano. Okay, hi. We were three of us, uh, Silvano Mbatu and Charles Wanga, and we have a quick story that we thought is radicalization. Um, Charles shared a story from where he works in uh, 
Malindi. Malindi is in Kenya's coast. Um, we came up with a story which is shared that is common on what happens over there with religion. Um, there is a pastor who has a church known as Good News International. And in this church, this pastor has radicalized children, women, they don't seek medical attention, children don't go to school. They even stay at his church, almost like boarding there. Uh, so uh, when he has observed that, um, what is happening, it looks like radicalization. So we thought this can be an interesting story to do. And uh, we even called it a cult or gospel radicalization in most of Kenyan churches. So these are common happenings, not only in that particular church, but we see places where people don't go to hospital when they are sick. They don't want to be registered for government programs because they say uh, that is not right according to the Bible. And then he uses the Bible to justify his deeds. So that's the story we came up with. And I think it's doable. Thank you. Excellent, Josephine. It says, uh, I think these are important stories when we see people's lives, you know, being very affected by, uh, like you say, a, a sort of a radicalization or however we put it. And we see that in uh, sometimes in our own faith or in others' faith. And, and it's important for us, I think, to look into it, especially when there's uh, maybe children involved and there could be uh, bad consequences from what's going on. So that looks like a good story. Thank you. All right, one more group, room six. We have Rosemary, Bamfu, Gembroski, and Jillian. Okay, here I'm Rosemary from Nairobi. I'll just briefly present mine and other members of our team could also do the same because I'm not in a position to say exactly what theirs was all about. So mine is to do with the youth and I'm branding it, God of the city and God of the village. What exactly do I mean? We have young people who are raised in the city and also young people who are raised in the village. I am going to lay it, and when it comes in terms of reality, the two groups of people have their own perception of God, depending on where they were raised and how they were raised and the interpretation of religion. So I'm thinking of taking a reality show approach where we have youth who've been raised in the city, youth who've been raised in the village and they're brought together and come up with issues that need to be solved using religious values. And we see how they handle it and how they, make the they manage the conflict that is likely to arise from how they manage the situation. Why do I think this is important? I feel this is important because there has been conflicts the same religion, the same, but how they interpret real life issues becomes a challenge because finally these youth end up meeting somewhere, maybe a campus, college, at work, and then they all had all these different interpretations of religion. And they end up with a very unnecessary conflict. I've seen cases where even the style of how they dress one is forced when they go to the village to change what they wear, how they walk, how they talk, because they all have different interpretation of religion. So that's what I had in mind in a few words. It's an interesting insight and I'd like to see the email pitch of how you might uh, execute it. But I think the insight's kind of true that, uh, I mean, in terms of our rural or urban experiences and how different that is with religion. Okay. Um, Melissa, where do we stand like now? You'd like me to respond to that? Um, actually, email is good, right? Yeah, Rosemary, if you could send us more details by email. And actually, for those of you, I'm going to put in the chat the email address for and some instructions for uh, how you can send a pitch if you want to do a story for us to pitch it to us uh, by email. I put the email addresses and our names, etc. And uh, I guess I didn't say too, we do pay for stories. So uh, it depends on if it's an opinion or a reporting and the, the, if it's how the involvement, how, how uh, in depth the reporting is, but we do pay people for their work, okay? So Melissa, did we hear from each of the groups? 
We did. That was I'm, everyone. Good job, guys. I'm sure there were some amazing ideas we didn't get to hear. So please work on a pi uh, the pitch to email to us if you want to report for this uh, Religion Unplugged site. Okay. And now, thank you guys so much. That was great. Um, now we're going to hear from Dr. Paul Marshall. So Dr. Marshall, if you can turn on, I'm going to give a quick introduction to him. Um, Dr. Marshall is one of our board members for the Media Project, really a scholar in every sense of the word. He's senior fellow at the Center for Religious Freedom um, with the Hudson Institute. Um, so he is also the Wilson Distinguished Professor of Religious Freedom um, at Baylor University. And he's a research professor in political science. So he's the author and editor of more than 20 books on religion and politics, especially religious freedom. Um, I will put in the chat a link to his website so you can check him out more and be in touch with him. Many of you have likely heard him speak at some of our events before, particularly in the Asia Pacific Journalism um, Institute program that we do. But we're so excited to have him here to share with us today. Dr. Marshall is leading his session today on blasphemy and other threats to freedom of religion and speech. So let's all give him a warm welcome. Welcome, Dr. Marshall. Okay, um, thank you very much indeed, Melissa. And it's great to see uh, so many old friends and young friends too. So um, without further ado, let me get into, into my presentation because we want to have some time for discussion. <laughs> so here we go. And I will say you guys are welcome to post questions and chat as they come up and I'll keep track of those for the Q&A time. Okay, as I wanna talk about uh, blasphemy or accusations of blasphemy and other threats to uh, religious freedom. It's very much in the news right now. Um, as, as you will know, um, last week, Samuel Patti, a French middle school teacher was beheaded in the street in a suburb of Paris. Why? Because he'd shown his class some of what were often called the Muhammad cartoons uh, in the uh, French magazine, Charlie Hebdo. So this has uh, led, as in previous occasions, to international incidents, particularly because um, French President Macron uh, was unusually outspoken, called it a um, Islamist terrorist attack, and uh, he, the teacher was killed for teaching children freedom of speech. This has led to boycotts of French products in the Middle East. This all happened in 2005 with the Danish cartoons. Uh, criticisms from the president of Pakistan, President Erdogan of uh, Turkey insulted Macron. France has withdrawn its ambassador. One could go on and on. Uh, um, these events are reminiscent of many similar ones in recent decades, but I fear all too often um, we forget about them and we fail to see the patterns which exist. I want to talk about those patterns. Uh, in a book which I and Nina Shea published a while back called Silenced, we looked at um, accusations of blasphemy um, worldwide. Uh, we covered about 36 countries and several thousand incidents. Um, these are the patterns we find. Firstly, the restrictions on blasphemy and similar terms now often developed in the West like hate speech and so forth um, are very widespread. They're used in a lot of settings. Um, we'll find them in Russia, Netherlands, Poland, Germany, India, Sri Lanka. So they exist in many parts of the world. And if you actually check laws on the books, um, the criminalization of defaming religion, such laws are actually most widespread in Europe, more so than anywhere else in the world. But in most cases, they are not used and haven't been used in, in half a century. In some places, Russia, they have been, but by and large, while the laws are on the books, nothing is happening. But if instead of who has a law written down, 
if we look at the number of cases and the much more widespread private attacks, that is the government doesn't go after you, but a terrorist does or a mob, uh, this is most pre prevalent in the Muslim majority world, especially the greater Middle East. They occur outside of here, but within that red circle, you would get most of the cases that exist in the world. There's tremendous variation, as we know, but here are five recurring patterns. First, the events that get tend to get the most international attention. You may remember the famous Danish cartoons in the newspaper Yale and Post them in 2005, or American pastor Terry Jones threatening to burn a Koran, the attacks on the French magazine Charlie Hebdo, and now recently the beheading of Samuel Paty. Um, these get the news and they should, but they are atypical they're unusual in terms of what is going on with blasphemy in the world. We'll get to that later. So that's the first point. Secondly, the accusations are usually very vague. Uh, someone's got, did someone mute themselves? I've got another voice. Yeah, I'm going through trying to mute everyone okay. now, but yes, if everybody could okay. please be sure to be muted. The accusations are often vague. Here's a partial list. Um, for which people have been arrested or killed, insulting Islam, hurting Muslims' feelings, insulting a heavenly religion, propagation of spiritual liberalism, imitating Christians. Um, we, we collect about 50 or 60 of such accusations, and most have no clear definition. And uh, the rest of this presentation, I'm just going to use the word blasphemy for all of them. Uh, could be officially insulting religion, could be apostasy and so on, but I'll use the term blasphemy as a catch-all term for these types of accusations. So the terminology, the accusations are vague. Thirdly, they're often politically manipulated. I mentioned the Danish cartoon affair, uh, if you ask people about that, you'd say, what happened when uh, in September 2005, a Danish newspaper published mainly pretty harmless cartoons, uh, one of which depicted Islam's prophet Muhammad. And people say, well, there were riots, there were demonstrations, there were boycotts, international incidents. All this is true. But they didn't take place in 2005, they took place in 2006. When the cartoons actually came out, nothing much happened. It was only after Saudi Arabia at a conference of the Islamic Conference uh, called for making this an issue that activities took place and there were riots in Nigeria, there were in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and people were killed. And there was intense political lobbying. In other cases, there were the Swedish cartoons by Lars Wilkes. They produced almost no protest, nor did Geert Wilders film, uh, Dutch politician Geert Wilders film Fitna. So we find out that many of the attacks are not spontaneous religious outrage. It's not just that someone does something that someone else sees as blasphemous and then is, is angered and responds but result from political manipulation. When you get an international incident, there are usually some governments trying to get advantage out of it. This doesn't mean it's not religious. It, it's both political and religious. Unless people had religious outrage, you could never politically manipulate it. You can't politically manipulate religion unless religion's important. So it's usually both. But what I would say, and this is also true with the uh, present spat between France and Turkey and others, uh, there's political gain at stake. Fourth, while governments can be very bad, the greatest danger of an accusation of blasphemy is not the government, but society, mobs, vigilantes, and terrorists. If you take the example of Pakistan, 
Pakistan has very restrictive uh, blasphemy laws, but nobody has been executed in Pakistan for blasphemy in the modern age. But hundreds of people have died. Uh, they're, they're killed by mobs, they're killed in prison. People have been shot to death uh, coming out of a courtroom where they've been acquitted of blasphemy. So it's, it's the mob which is a greatest danger. I've just said that. And fifth, most accusations are not against Western cartoonists or writers or clergy. Most occur within the Muslim majority world and are usually accusations against Muslims, especially minorities and moderates. So to summarize those, those five trends, the big international incidents are atypical. The accusations um, are vague. The, um, uh, they occur mainly against um, Muslims and uh, are usually politically, often politically motivated. Uh, who tend to be the victims? Four major categories, again. One is, I'll just call them post-Islamic religions. I'm not sure that's a good word, probably isn't. But Baha'is or Ahmadiyya Muslims. A second category is um, people, converts, apostates, unbelievers. A third category is Sunni Muslims or Shia or Sufis when they are in the minority. And fourthly, Muslim religious and political reformers. For post-Islamic beliefs, Baha'is and Ahmadis are often accused of saying there was another prophet after um, at Muhammad, and therefore they are contradicting and criticizing Islam and suffer very widespread persecution. In Iran, there is no penalty, legal penalty for killing a Baha'i. In Pakistan, Ahmadiyya cannot even call themselves Muslim. The Baha'i leadership in Iran, uh, seven principal leaders uh, in prison and likely to be there for another eight years. Actual apostates, the people that, that leave Islam, they become unbelievers, atheists, or convert to Christianity or some other uh, religion. Um, these four, again, in Iran, um, sentenced for 10 years for evangelism but they are themselves uh, converts uh, from Islam. Uh, that's one of the principal reasons they have been imprisoned. Um, often the victims are falsely or mistakenly accused. It's a couple in Pakistan, Shami Bibi and Shajad Masi, uh, were burned to death and uh, by a mob because of a false accusation of blasphemy. They weren't tried, they weren't convicted. Someone said they blasphemed, and so they, a mob killed them. Another one, Shabazz Bhatti, the highest ranking Christian in the Pakistan government. He was minister for minorities. Uh, he was shot to death um, for opposing the blasphemy law. Uh, another case, Ahak, um, that, that's his nickname, um, Ahak. Uh, the then Christian governor of Jakarta, the capital of uh, Indonesia, was ac falsely accused of blasphemy. A person doctored a video of him for it and was sentenced to two years imprisonment. He's the one on the left, I'm the one on the right. So he's now out and actually head of the Indonesian major national oil company. So a third category, Muslims of the wrong type, that is you're a minority type of Muslim. If you're a Sunni Muslim, for example, in Iran, which is majority Shia, or you're a Shia Muslim in Egypt or Malaysia, which is majority Shia, you can suffer persecution. Uh, for Sufis, more mystical type of Muslims, um, there's often a crackdown on them in uh, Iran. And then Muslim religious and political reformers. I'm going to spend more 
time on them because in many ways they are key to everything else. And when they are silenced, it suppresses debate, dissent and renewal in the Muslim majority world. Just a few examples. Um, Ali Mohakek Nassab, he is an uh, Afghan journalist, uh, editor of a magazine uh, actually called Women's Rights, but this is Afghanistan, so the editor was male. Uh, but his magazine published it in the case where a convert to Christianity in Afghanistan had been sentenced to death. His magazine published an article saying, does Islam really mandate that we kill apostates and stone adulterers? They asked that question. For that, he was accused of blasphemy and subsequently imprisoned. And his particular case was an eye opener for me. One of the main reasons I got interested in the subject because I realized you cannot deal with the killing of converts the killing of adulterers, unless you can discuss it. If the topic is off limits, it cannot be changed. And so when someone raises the question as imprisoned for it, you cannot do anything about the other issues. And that's why I regard this question of blasphemy as central. It's the blocking point to discussing a whole host of other problems. It forbids discussion. And if you can't discuss problems, you can't do anything about them. One other example, Mohsen Kadavar, an Iranian, he published a three volume uh, dense work called The Theory of the State in Shiite Jurisprudence, um, which criticized the government's view and he was accused of blasphemy and imprisoned. Uh, this it happens not only in Pakistan or Egypt or Iran, uh, in the West, just one example of many. Ikin Delegos, the first Muslim member of parliament in Germany. She has to travel with bodyguards because she has criticized the status of women in many of the Muslim communities in, in Germany. And there are other examples. Uh, not only Muslims in the West, but non-Muslims. Here's a photograph from the Al-Qaeda magazine, Inspire. Um, I'm sure if you're gonna read it, but it says, yes, we can. A bullet a day keeps the infidel away. And the various pictures, uh, the Dutch politician, Keert Wilders, the Swedish cartoonist, Lars uh, Wilkes, Fleming Rose, publisher of the Allen Poston uh, newspaper, Salman Rushdie, uh, many others. And um, a, a cartoonist journalist, uh, Molly Moore, also on the death list here. So talked about particular accusations against people, people who are suffered or are threatened because of their stance. But of course, the wider pattern is not the people who are directly attacked, uh, but the people who watch what happens. You're a journalist and a fellow journalist writes a, a story which could be interpreted usually falsely as blasphemous and is threatened or killed. Uh, Molly Norris, the car American cartoonist I mentioned, she went into hiding, witness protection, she had to have a change of identity. Um, if you're a cartoonist, what cartoons are you gonna write, uh, uh, paint in the future? If you're a journalist, what stories are you going to cover? And I know many of you face threats from this and from many other things, but it produces a pattern where certain things are not discussed. It can happen even in you know, normal everyday affairs, not necessarily through violence or anything. The New York Times in 2014 wrote a story about a statue of Muhammad that had been on top of the major courthouse at Madison Avenue and 25th Street. So it was an article about a statue of Muhammad, but the Times refused to show a photograph of the statue. Amazing. Uh, just a counter example, by the way, when people say there aren't portrayals of uh, Muhammad around, 
Uh, this is the uh, US Supreme Court building. Uh, Mohammed is shown on the frieze at the top there um, as one of the world's major lawgivers. Here's a close up right there next to uh, Grotius. And particularly when uh, you're targeting Muslim reformers or dissidents, one of the major effects of this self-censorship is suppressing debate and renewal within Islam itself. Just some examples. Uh, this is Salman Tazir. Uh, he was the uh, governor of Punjab in Pakistan, a Muslim. Uh, Punjab covers almost half of Pakistan. He defended uh, Asia Bibi, a Christian woman accused of blasphemy, and he opposed um, Pakistan's blasphemy laws and called for them to re be repealed. So he defended someone and criticized a law. For that, he was killed by one of his bodyguards as a blasphemer. That is, opposing the law itself was being treated privately as illegal. And at Hudson Institute, his daughter in a speech said, this is a warning to every liberal, that is everybody who believes in freedom and free speech, shut up or be shot. The late Abdullah Ram Wahid, uh, former president of Indonesia and former president of Nadatul Ulama, the world's largest Muslim organizations, um, um, Wahid wrote the foreword to the book I mentioned, which I'm summarizing, uh, called Silence. Um, he wrote a very good foreword called God Need no, Needs No Defense. And in it, he argues that blasphemy laws and accusations narrow the bounds of acceptable discourse, not only about religion, but about vast spheres of life, literature, science, and culture in general. Uh, to conclude, I would emphasize, particularly when we're, we're uh, talking to, amongst journalists, we need to resist such restrictions as much as we can. When politics and religion are intertwined, as they necessarily are in debates about blasphemy, then unless you're allowed religious debate and dissent, there can be no political debate and dissent. Unless we're allowed religious disagreement, there can be no political disagreement allowed. Thank you very much indeed. Right, thank you so much, Dr. Paul Marshall, that's great. Um, okay, so let's go through looking at some of the, the questions, Q&A. Um, let's see here, we have here, well, Doctor, the situation with the Rohingyas in Myanmar could be political or we have religion too? Uh, both. The, um, with the Rohingyas, they are firstly a, a Muslim minority within a majority Buddhist uh, country. Um, secondly, many of them are more recent arrivals in the country, but we're talking generations back. You know, it, it, it didn't, didn't come last year. So in order to solidify it within um, Myanmar, you have a government still largely controlled by the military. They don't run it directly, but they are the power behind the throne. And uh, to assert their control, um, if you want to assert control over a population, it's always good to have an enemy. So the Rohingya can function as an enemy. Uh, they've also accused people in the Rohingya of you know, being terrorists. And there are now some, but the terrorism arose after the massacres uh, by the government. Uh, also an attempt to solidify power by um, uh, kicking out minorities, seeking to move them into Bangladesh and other areas. And then appealing to the sentiment that uh, Myanmar is a Buddhist country historically and truly, and minorities here are guests, they may be allowed here, um, but they're not really the core, the center 
of the country. So you get um, this amalgam of um, uh, religion and nationalism and drive for political power, which are combined and lead to the persecution of the Rohingya. Again, if I can just comment on the sort of religion politics nexus, um, I have a paper on this, but the um, often people say, oh, that's political, not religious. And my response is that would be like saying of a table, that table is not round, it's blue. A table can be blue and round. An event can be political or religious. What's the governing party in, in, in Germany? The Christian Democratic Party. Is that a religious group? Is it a political group? The answer is yes. It's a political party which wants to uphold um, Christian principles. And um, often when people say it's political, not religious, perhaps a more precise way of putting it would be to say it's insincere religion. Uh, what I mean by that is this, that um, if a government wants to manipulate religious feelings, it can only do that if there are religious feelings to manipulate. If people don't care about their religion, you can't manipulate them. They just go, huh. So the religious commitment, the religious understanding, the religious devotion needs to be there in the first place before it can be manipulated. So it needs to be political and religious. What we're often getting at when we say it's political, we mean that the government or a demagogue or whoever's using it isn't in their heart, you know, expressing their religious sensitivity, uh, but seeking to use the religion which is present in order to advance another agenda. So uh, we, we should say it's a mouthful the political manipulation of religion is often what's going on. And is the same true? There was another question about the Uyghur in China. Is it political or religious persecution? Is it similar to what you're saying? It's both. Um, yeah, very similar in structure. In structure, there is you know in China now uh, quite a bit of Han nationalism. You know, a lot of minorities in in. Um, China, as indeed there are in Myanmar, the, um, but the idea that the Han are the sort of real Chinese. A uh, second thing is that um, worries about possible separatism. So uh, you see this within Tibet. Um, you see this in uh, Xinjiang with the, with, with the Uyghur. So one of the things the Chinese government has been seeking to do is to move uh, millions of Han Chinese into these areas so that in Tibet, Tibetans will become a minority. In Xinjiang, Uyghurs will become a minority. So it, it squashes possible separatism. A third element is uh, religious in that um, religions usually provide another loyalty to that of the state. You know, uh, um, Augustine in the City of God says we're citizens of two kingdoms. And uh, uh, Christians or Muslims um, or Buddhists or others will have a loyalty to their religion, which can be in tension with the loyalty to a government. And most governments really don't like a dual loyalty. Indeed, that's the reason the Christian church was persecuted under the Romans for the refusal to say that the emperor was the god above gods. And so in China, um, the Chinese Communist Party doesn't want people to have a strong commitment to any other center of authority. So with the Uyghurs, that's Islam. So the uh, uh, Uyghurs have to, if they're to go on the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, uh, they're supposed to show good behavior, that is, doing what the party says. They've often forced them to eat non-halal food or drink alcohol. 
but a su su suppression um, of Islam and demanding that the party uh, be put first. You've seen this in, even with Christians in China saying that they must declare their first loyalty is to, is to President Xi. And they, they're putting out their own version of the Bible and so on. So again, it's this combination of uh, nationalism with its, its fear of separatism, uh, religion, and uh, striving for political power. It's, it's, it's a common pattern in the world. All right. Okay. We have a question from Eric Sampson. Should we explain and defend more the concept of lay city? Uh, it depends what is meant here, just background. Uh, laicite is an um, expression usually developed in, in France. And um, the idea was that firstly to disestablish the Catholic Church, so it wouldn't have political power, it would not have an official relation to the state. Those are uh, the first two elements. Uh, but the notion of laïcité in France goes further and said, there is no place for religion in the public realm. So for example, whereas in um, Germany, you can have a Christian democratic party and a party saying it wants to uphold Christian principles, that would be very difficult in France. It would be told it was illegitimate. You, you cannot bring religion in there. So when the French take a census, you're not allowed to ask any questions about religion. That's uh, one reason it's often difficult to get religion statistics in France. So um, France has also used that to forbid um, Muslims and others from not only wearing a, a face veil, niqab, uh, but from a head covering, uh, a hijab in, in schools or elsewhere. Um, so it's, uh, it becomes an aggressive secularism. Uh, just recently, you know, um, after, the, after the killing of the beheading of the school teacher last week, uh, French President Macron had a big push to um, uh, limit terrorism, to crack down on terrorism, the source of terrorism. Well, he's cracking down on a lot more than Muslims. Part of that legislation, by the way, is the forbidding of homeschooling by anybody in France, uh, because you wanna keep religion out of education, even if it's done at home. So um, laïcité in that sense, I think goes um, much too far. Um, if there's a spectrum of sort of wanting to limit the role of religion um, in the state, you would have, um, one end, I'd put something like the United States. Traditionally, India has been very similar. Uh, then moving towards a more secular restrictive one to France. Uh, going a bit further, you get to Turkey. And then you get to communist countries, um, you know, finally in, in North Korea. So I would want to emphasize not so much a secular society or secular government, as a plural one. You, you're not seeking to squeeze religion out. You're seeking to make the public area, politics and society open to everyone on an equal basis. So, and one of my interests in Indonesia is I think um, Indonesia um, is a very religious society and religion has an effect on the shaping of the state, but it has no established religion. Okay, I'll stop there. So interesting. Okay, Martina is asking, in what country or countries with a Muslim majority could we see a political party comparable to the CDU, CSU in Germany? Um, in, let's go back to Indonesia. Um, the, it, let's see, there's Indonesians here and they'll know this far more than I. Um, but there are uh, three to four Indonesian political parties that um, claim to be Islamic in some ways. One of these, uh, the National Awakening Party, is, um, has its roots in Nadatul Ulama, which I mentioned earlier, 
whose former president wrote the forward to the, uh, my book, Silenced. Um, the National Awakening Party is like a Christian Democratic Party. And indeed, for background, the, the Christian Democratic Party, the very common, as the uh, people from Latin America know, very common in Latin America, very common in, in much of Europe, mainly with Catholic roots, but the German one has Protestant roots, the, the uh, Dutch one has, has Protestant roots. And they formed an so international network alliance called the uh, uh, Christian Democratic Alliance. And uh, it's now the largest grouping of political parties in the world. I think it has now about 73 parties in it. Uh, recently, it, it renamed and recategorized itself. It went from being the Christian Democratic Alliance to the centrist democratic alliance, because uh, they mainly tend to be centrist parties. And, uh, but still the vast majority are Christian, uh, explicitly Christian democratic. But amongst the other ones who have joined are several Muslim parties. So the National Awakening Party is now part of the international network, which was the Christian Democratic Center. And there's a party from Mauritania and several other Muslim oriented parties within that network. Um, so they, uh, they do a, um, exist in Sudan, the Republican Brotherhood was a revival to the Muslim Brotherhood, but, but the Republican Brotherhood was also a Islamic oriented party. Um, so they um, do exist at the all right, another question. Paul was asking, what do you think are the best ways for journalists to cover the blasphemy issue, particularly in the Middle East? Um, well, firstly, very carefully, you know, because as you can see some of the examples, people end up accused of blasphemy, not because they said some nasty thing, but simply because they defended someone who was accused of uh, blasphemy. Um, the, I think one of the best ways is um, first to report what is happening. Uh, you probably cannot report what was said. You know, so-and-so was a blasphemer. In what way did he blaspheme? I can't tell you. It's like that famous Monty Python skit. Um, if you remember, John Cleese was a Roman centurion. They brought a blasphemer to him for stoning. He says, what did he do with his blasphemous? Well, we can't tell you. And so, um, so usually you cannot repeat the, whatever was said. If it is a form of blasphemy, again, in many of these, these contexts, it isn't. In, in any traditional meaning of blasphemy, it wasn't blasphemy. They just uh, disagreed. So, and then I would, in offering a criticism or an analysis, a journalist would do this anyway, go through a third party. If you're not yourself a Muslim, get the comments of a Muslim on this score, um, who's, who's willing to stand that out. And um, to analyze what was said and to state their own view um, on that matter. So particularly, uh, this isn't about blasphemy as such, but say in, in writing about um, Islamist terrorism, and people say, well, you shouldn't connect those two. Um, I will simply quote Muslims doing it. Um, so um, saying, you know, you know, there's a problem with Islam right now. There's extremists in every religion, but right now we've got a lot more of them than the other religions appear to have. And um, so go through those particular third parties. Uh, speaking of which, the um, person I often quote because he's a friend is Yaya uh, Stokil Stakouf in um, Indonesia. Um, uh, US Vice President Pompeo is going to Indonesia um, this week. And he's going to meet with Indonesian President Jokowi. But the purpose of his trip is to meet with Nadatul Ulama and its youth wing, Ansor and Pak Yahya. 
So uh, back up though, it's, you might want to write about that. I do, let's hope we don't um, scoop each other. Nope. Are there any leading think tanks and watchdogs on this issue that we should know about? Um, the uh, Hudson Institute has, well, firstly, plug the, the Center for Religious Freedom at, at the Hudson Institute to which I'm connected. There's another center, um, which is a mouthful. It's called the Center for the Study of Islam and Democracy in the Muslim World. The reason for that long thing is people study Islam and democracy, but often just theoretically. And this is you know, what's actually happening out there. The two directors of uh, that are uh, Hussein Haqqani, um, who is um, former P ambassador of Pakistan to the United States uh, till the Pakistani intelligence tried to kill him. So, and then Hillel Franken, who you might guess from his name is Jewish, but is one of the, uh, a leading authority on things Islamic. So at that Hudson Center, the uh, Religious Freedom Institute, sorry for all these American examples, uh, but the Religious Freedom Institute covers a whole range of religious freedom things, but it has a within it a center for Islam and religious freedom. I would also want to, uh, there is a, um, group think tank in England called the Quilliam Foundation, which is, is Muslim oriented. Um, in Indonesia, I'd mentioned uh, Nardatul Ulama and uh, similar groupings. Um, keep an eye on them. They put a lot of information out also out in, in English, uh, also Muhammadiyah. In fact, as we talk, there's quite a big conference um, being held in Indonesia, which I'd be at if I wasn't here and uh, organized by the Ministry of Religious Affairs, again, addressing questions of, of religious freedom. Of particular journalists, uh, Mustafa Akyol, uh, who many of you know, who's spoken at uh, Media Project um, conferences. Um, he's, he's Turkish, he's, he hasn't been back to Turkey for a while because he's annoyed the government too much. That's the trouble with many of the good people we're talking about. They are, can find it difficult to be at home. And then um, the um, teachers in Australia, he's from the Maldives. Um, my mind's going, um, does a lot of writing books and um, other things on um, religious freedom from a, um, a, a Muslim perspective. So I'd mention him and hopefully, while we're still going on, the name will pop back into my mind. Okay, Julia's on the, on the Zoom Abdul, with us. Sorry, no. Abdullah Saeed. Okay. Okay. I came to you, good job. Yeah. <laughs> um, what is the name of the Indonesian group that you quoted? Um, the, the umbrella group is uh, Nad Nadatul Ulama, N-A-H-D, Nad, L-A-T-U-L. And then second word, Ulama, Ulama. Perfect, Herto just, put it, in, Herto uh, just put it in chat for us. Thank you, Herto. Thank you. And then it's Youth Wing, it's called Ansor. Youth, by the way, seems to be defined as under 40. So, and um, I've, I've they're, they're people I've been working with for quite a while now. Okay, Paul, uh, Martina was asking maybe when, before we completely go, maybe you could type some of these in chat or you could email it to us and we could send out an email, um, the names of the think tanks, of watchdogs if people wanna follow them. Okay. Um, let's see, any other questions? Eric has another question. What is the situation of Christian communities taken out of their living zones in Iraq and other countries by the Islamic State? Are they returning? Um, I best to ask my colleague Nina Shea, who's, who's more up on this. Uh, not many. Some are returning. 
um, but they um, it's pretty in, inhospitable when they get back. Many are in the Kurdish areas, which is a better place to be. That is, you know, the Kurds aren't killing you or whatever, um, but you're still second-class citizens if you're um, Christians. If someone has moved into your house, it's very hard to get them to move out. You don't really have any muscle and support. Uh, the Iraqi Iraq, the Iraqi government um, is not that supportive um, of Christians. And there has been problems with external aid, which doesn't get through to them. Um, thing we've been trying to do, we being people at Hudson, not I personally haven't been involved, but a big effort over the last four to five years with is with the USAID the aid organization saying, not just for Christians, but for Yazidis or for anybody really. I said, in, in a religiously divided society and you're supplying aid, don't let go of the aid till it's in the hands of co-religionists of where it's going to be going to. Otherwise it might not find it, its way through. And that, that's taken a, um, a lot of work to convince them of that. Um, but to some degree that's, that's been happening. But uh, uh, most have not returned. And um, I don't study refugees, but people who do say there's a certain time limit. If people don't go back in the first few years when it still has home, they're unlikely to go back. You know, that after five, six years, they've left. Wow, that's interesting. Very interesting. Okay, Paul, this is fascinating. Thank you so much for your discussion today. I think it really provoked a lot of great questions. If you, um, Paul, if you're able to write and chat any of the names of any of the think tanks or things, um, people might want to have that. And if not, then we can get that from you and I can email it to everyone. Okay. Um, so thank you so much, Paul. We appreciate it, Dr. Paul Marshall for um, your lecture today. Um, Paul Gladder, before I do kind of a preview for tomorrow, do you have any parting words for today? Um, I did put a link to uh, Paul Marshall's, a PDF of a talk that Paul Marshall gave in, I believe it was 2015. Yep. Uh, yeah, at the King's College in New York, right after Charlie Hebdo. Uh, so it was a similar talk to this one today, but it's in print form about blasphemy, free speech and freedom of religion. So I put that in the chat. Um, we could also email it perhaps later to participants, but if you want to share the, you know, the, the general uh, concept here with others or download it and read it, you have it right there. Um, and I just want to say thank you so much to Paul Marshall, our mm -hmm. board member, and um, for explaining this to us. I found it incredibly helpful, and I hope you, the rest of you did as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's great. Um, looking ahead to tomorrow, we have a, a friend of Dr. Marshall's is going to be with us. Um, let me give him the slide. So Dr. Philip Jenkins of Baylor is going to be sharing about his new book, Fertility and Faith, The Demographic Revolution and the Transformation of World Religions. So he's going to lead that. We're going to have a discussion about the political and religious consequences of these changes and shaping the domestic and international affairs of countries like India, Turkey, Israel, Russia. Um, we'll start in the morning like we are, we'll start our session, it's evening for many of you, um, with details like a way for you to really engage. Um, we'll start with an interactive time like we have where we break into breakouts for a good um, 10, 15 minutes for you to connect. And then tomorrow we'll really try to connect you with people in your region so you can build relationships there, maybe with people even in your own city. Um, and then we'll end by really sharing ways that you can get engaged with TMP in the year ahead. Um, I think it's really exciting to see all of you here and being a part of this. And it really helps us to know that there's a need and an interest for coming together. And since we're able to do this virtually, this could be the beginning of um, time that we do this more regularly to really come together. We wanna hear from you. We're here to serve you. You are a part of our family um, here at the Media Project. And, and so much of what we do behind the scenes throughout the year, even when we were able to have our in-person programs, was really about finding ways that we can serve you, um, that we can really encourage you and the place where you are right now as a journalist and 
Um, for those of you who are covering religion, and we know that you are facing a lot of challenges, everyone is right now, especially during this time of COVID. So we wanna be here to serve you and engage with you. And I'm really just so encouraged and excited to have you all be a part of this because I feel like it really is the beginning of us coming together even during this difficult time on a more regular basis. So I hope you can join us tomorrow. We'll be the same time and place. Um, and it'll be great to see you again. Invite your friends, especially if those of you who are part of previous classes, invite your pointer, you know, go on the WhatsApp channel and encourage them to come to you because um, tomorrow's our last day that we're having this Zoom meeting um, at 10 o'clock Eastern time. We will be having on Thursday, we invite you to participate and come to our Facebook live lecture, which is at noon Eastern time. So two hours later, I know that gets really late in certain parts of the world for you guys, um, but we'd love to have you on our Facebook live channel. And I'll tell you more about that tomorrow and send you an email about that too, how you can engage with us on that. But so good to see you all. Um, any questions for us before we go for the day? Melissa, can we get all the presentation uh, like from uh, Dr. Marshall and even from Jill yesterday? Is that possible for slides. us to get? Yeah, so yeah, we have just... two things, two things. We have our sessions recorded. So we are gonna make those available for you. And then I will request the speakers to pro provide their slides to see if they're okay with that. And then email these to you as well. Awesome. It's a great Thank idea. You. Any other Thank questions? You. That's one quick one, Melissa. So I was yes. wondering, I was, I was uh, uh, wondering if Dr. Marsha can just tell us what should journalists in Africa watch out for regarding uh, blasphemy? Mm. Oh, Dr. Oh. Marshall, you're um, you're muted. Sorry. Yeah, I was just typing that out to you. The, oh. the of course, the, the countries are, are very different, but um, mainly what I'd said uh, earlier, be very careful in that people get accused of blasphemy for simply writing about it. The, um, secondly, um, you will, will need to be sort of distant and elusive in, in, in saying what it is, you know, what is that? Someone's accused of blasphemy that was seen as insulting something. You usually cannot um, quote them or be too specific. And thirdly, in raising questions, and we're talking about blasphemy now in the Muslim context, it occasionally comes up in, in other ones, but um, to use Muslims as your spokespeople, if you want to criticize the accusation or whatever it is, um, have a Muslim do this for you and to suggest um, what way we should go. And also I, I noticed that um, um, to, let me go back, where was it? It was Julia, yeah, who had said um, in Pakistan, um, you know, it's impossible to remove the blasphemy laws, you get killed for suggesting it. Uh, can we just do a second best, which is to try and sort of reform them to get all these false accusations um, out of the way and provide protections, for example, um, in Pakistan judges, because judges are very fearful of acquitting someone accused of blasphemy. Um, even if there's no evidence against them, because the judge themselves then becomes a target. So, um, in general, in general, be uh, be circumspect and write around the subject. So. Okay, and Eric, do you want to ask your question? No, I was saying it's interesting to see the difference of conception about. Uh, laicity, you know, I'm French, mm -hmm. have a, a really different conception of Dr. Marshall with all due respect, of course, I mean, yeah. but um, we, we do have a problem, a third of the uh, Muslim population in France, which can be French or, or stranger, um, you know, a poll shows that they do consider that the laws of uh, mm -hmm. uh, their, their religion are above the laws of the Republic. I mean, they do believe that the Sharia should be installed, that uh, um, 
uh, well, this kind of stuff. So how do you fight against them? But, uh, how do you fight against that, that conception? It's kind of difficult because in the same time, <clears throat> you can understand in theory, I mean, you know, the law of God should be, could be considered that above, but in the same times we are in Republic with a long history. So what do you do when you have kind of a separatism inside the whole country, you know, zones where uh, sometimes they do uh, their uh, relief uh, systems, they, you know, they give help to the, the poorest Muslims, things that the states do. So that's what do the, um, the Islamic brothers, this kind of stuff. But what do you do to fight that when, when you have a part of the population that do not want to follow the rules of a republic? Oh, uh, yeah, you, you need to fight that. My comments about the Cité are this sort of um, secular view, which is often um, repressive of a um, variety of religions, including, you know, small sect type groups and things of this kind. Uh, if you're dealing with, um, firstly, if you're dealing with terrorism, and you're dealing with an ideology which wants to undercut the state, uh, that's something you need to, to combat. And um, I would add that a, a too strong secularism uh, can hinder that. Uh, you're French, so you know much more than I do about you know, what has been going on there. But um, yeah, the French government has been trying to organize a sort of French type of Islam, uh, putting requirements that imams should be able to speak French, things of this kind. I'm supportive of those. Um, that uh, be because you have a you know, specific goal in mind, you would need to add that you know, groups of other religions should be able to speak French. Um, also, I, th I think these are legitimate moves uh, but note also that this involves the government in religious matters, in trying to uh, organize Muslim groups to try and get them into an overarching body so you can actually talk to them, you know, because, you know, if Macron wants to talk to the Muslim community, who does he speak to? So you, you try and get an umbrella group. All of this involves the state, you know, getting very active in the uh, religious sphere, um, which in some senses laicite says it shouldn't. So um, I, I think the steps the French government are taking, the good steps, are because it's you know, putting laicite to one side and say, I always say with the, the French, you know, is this, you know, raison d'etat uh, will trump um anything else let, let me ask you a question on this i had heard that uh when the uh, french government put restrictions on the, the wearing of the hijab um uh muslims could still go to catholic schools and wear the hijab so the french government was finding ways of supporting their ability to do so so the french government was ending up providing indirect support to catholic schools is this the case, do you know? There is a, a, a support to Catholic uh, schools, yes. And, you know, you have different, it's like what the, the debate we are having, uh, you know, in France, you have partisans of the very strict, they call that combat laicity, you know, like yeah. some kind of the most, and others who are more uh, flexible. Um, but I'm afraid that right now, I think the, the deputation of the teacher has been a huge shock. I don't know how long it will last because you know the Charlie Hebdo uh, killings were also a huge shock and, mm -hmm. and but we are feeling that you know um, in particular um, foreign imam they are testing us you know we we see more and more that the problem is not necessary you know the imam in the mosque or something like that but it's small things like you know we see uh, more and more uh, doctors giving you know a certificate of chloride allergy so that the girls are not going to go to the public swimming pools with the boys they are asking mm -hmm. in public swimming pools to have different schedule hours you know like the, the boys at 9 to 10 and the girls 10 to 10 this kind of stuff they refuse some uh, more and more and not only the kids but the parents and the parents go to the school to the college they refuse the historical facts about Shoah about Holocaust 
they refused what you can say about uh, Saudi Arabia when you say that, well, no, you know, the rights of the women in Saudi Arabia are maybe not what they are in Sweden. I, I'm inventing that, you know, but uh, they refuse that. They refuse lots of conclusions about what should be facts, like, okay, that happens uh, 50 years ago, I mean, you know, Auschwitz, you know. And so they go, and so the, the, the parents go to schools and say, that teacher shouldn't be allowed to teach because he's teaching bad things, uh, this kind of stuff. So we are seeing a lot of, you know, like what we what you could call microaggressions, you know, you know, this, this part is taken a little bit here, a little bit there, a little bit there, and that is provoking. And now that, you know, with this teacher behaved, um, I personally, I, I'm afraid that one day, you know, and we are beginning to see that from time to time that you, you could have some reaction not of the states of the people of the, some people like you know all the friends saying yeah we are fed up of, uh, fed up with that and beginning to act and we are going beginning to see so maybe i hope it will not happen i do believe that a uh, big part of the muslim community wants to live quietly as everybody you know and practice their their religion uh, quietly mm -hmm. but you have a growing part and that's not a minority that the old polls show that it's at least a third, and a third is is a big amount mm -hmm. of people that do believe that uh, no, the laws of the republic are not above, and that is that is provoking. Uh, I don't know if this is why there is that combat lay city concept, but it's a growing problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay, no, I agree with those problems. So my point would be um, that the government has to get more involved religiously in order to actually yeah. deal with these problems. <laughs> just as one, this is just one of my favorite trivia questions, which I'm sure Eric knows the answer to. Um, but is there an established church in France? What, what, sorry, I didn't get that, Islam? Is there an established church in France? What, the, the, the Catholic church? I don't get the, the, the question. Is there an established church? Yes, there is. Yes, yes, yeah, sure. In, in Alsace Moselle. Well, because yeah, that's that's a Germany, <laughs> the 1905 law. Yeah. The French president appoints the bishops. This is a very special place of France, no? I mean, with those specific laws, their own. Uh, yeah, I uh, live there, I by the way. I lived three years in Strasbourg. Yeah. So beautiful region, but it's special. The Concordat, I think they call that. Mm hmm. Yeah, it's very... anyway, I always like to mention that. Yeah, 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 yeah that's true. We have uh, specificities, no, of, um, about uh, about everywhere. Yeah. Great questions. Great discussion. Thank you so much, um, Eric, for your questions and your perspective. No, it's Thanks really, to you. it's really great. And thank you, Dr. Marshall, again for your time and sharing. We appreciate it. Okay, so we want to be sensitive to time. It's. Um, just time for the session to come to an end, but we look forward to seeing you again, same time tomorrow for our final session here on Zoom. And feel free to email me if you have any questions or need anything between now and then. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 See you tomorrow. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>